a great pleasure to talk to you tonight, and I want to take you into what I hope will be relatively unfamiliar territory. And I also must thank those who organized this, not forgetting the sponsor, Deloitte. So thank you for asking me, and I'm now going to talk about my chosen subject, which is challenges to the human future, prospects and hazards. When I've done, I hope that you will ask me questions or make points afterwards, because one of the pleasures of giving a lecture is less, is more what happens afterwards than what happens during the lecture itself. Now, in order to look forward, we have first to look back. And I want to begin by reminding you, if you need reminding, that humans are only one species among the millions that have existed and still exist on the surface of the Earth. We're a tiny part of a global environment which is limited, ephemeral, and precarious. It's just that the shortness of our lives and the length of history mean that we're mostly unaware of change and until now have scarcely noticed the human impact on the environment. Now, in the last couple of centuries, we've seen an extraordinary stretching of our understanding of space and time. We can now look beyond the solar system, beyond our galaxy, beyond billions of other galaxies, back to the Big Bang, which initiated the universe that we know. And as for time, we can look beyond the last thousand years, beyond the beginnings of civilization, beyond the patch of warmth, which is the last 12,000 years, and beyond the many spasms of the Ice Ages, right back to the beginnings of life itself. And that was not something that previous generations could have done. So in a way, we're very privileged to have this stretching of time and space, which is something that my lot have always greatly appreciated and wanted to understand better. Now, during the almost unimaginable stretches of time, there have been big hits from space, the changing relationship between the Earth and the Sun, the slow movement of tectonic plates on the Earth's surface, the rise and fall of sea levels, major volcanic eruptions, and not least the influence of life itself. And the tightly linked living organisms on the Earth's surface tend to create and maintain the Earth's environment, more than perhaps was realized even a few years ago. Now, over time, the whole system has tipped, sometimes violently to the detriment of this or that group of organisms, but there have always been correctives. But today, and that is the point I really want to underline, one small animal species, which is our own, is tipping the system in ways that cannot be foreseen. And our species is very new in, in Earth terms. No one was around to record the first evolution of the human-like creatures from ape to ancestors in Africa some four million years ago. They left the trees for the savannah. They became relatively hairless. They learned to walk upright on two legs with consequences for the physiology of their growing brains. By at least half a million years ago, they split into a variety of related strains and spread far beyond Africa. Indeed, one of their offshoots, as you may have heard, may have been living on the island of Flores in Indonesia only 12,000 years ago, quite substantially different from the lot that we are. Now, evidence for humans with modern characteristics goes back, I suppose, some perhaps 40,000 years in Europe at least, with the discoveries of artifacts and jewellery and, of course, those marvellous paintings on the walls of caves. But whatever the changes, whenever the changes took place, the extraordinary development of the human brain, which has produced ourselves, occupies less than 1% of all human history. Now, of course, in the last 40,000 years, that impact has greatly increased. Hunter-gatherers fitted easily, although sometimes uncomfortably, into the ecosystems of cold and warm periods of the Pleistocene epoch. People migrated in response to changing conditions. But farming with land clearance between, started only between 10,000 and 8,000 years ago, and that, of course, changed everything. And with a vast increase in human population came towns, came cities, and came the society we know. And before the Industrial Revolution, which was only 250 years ago, 
and began, after all, in these islands. The effects of human activity were local or at most regional rather than global. But now the impact is indeed global and we face what Al Gore has described as a planetary emergency. Now the idea may be hard to accept when you think of these enormous lengths of time and all the things that have happened in history. It may be hard to accept, but we are in fact in a situation which has never happened before. There was a book recently which I commend to you called Something New Under the Sun. And Something New Under the Sun showed the degree to which current conditions are unique. The problem is almost on, an, on, a, on a geological scale. And no wonder that the Nobel Prize winner Paul Crutzen, with his colleague Eugene Sturmer, should have described the current epoch, uh, the Anthropocene, in succession to the Holocene, which ended at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So we are something which I want to underline, something in a new situation and we don't understand. What are the main factors which affect this new situation? Well, they all affect our future, which is why I'm talk taking this little digression at the beginning to talk about the background. <coughs> Briefly, they arise from human population increase, degradation of land, consumption of resources and accumulation of wastes, water pollution and supply, climate change in its many aspects and impacts, energy production, and, of course, loss of biodiversity. And of these factors, well, population issues are often ignored as somehow rather embarrassing or mixed up with religion and the ideology of development. Most people are broadly aware of land resource and waste problems, although far from accepting the remedies which are necessary. Water issues, both fresh and salt, have had a lot of publicity, and already far from accepting, the re we, we know what to do, but we are far from accepting the remedies necessary. Already uh, we look at climate change with its implications for atmospheric chemistry. And again, we understand what it is, although people are remarkably reluctant to do much about it. Yet, and, and of course, on the damage to the diversity of life is a rather neglected aspect. And as I was saying before, it's something which most people have not really fully focused on. Yet, it's there that human destructiveness has been most evident over the last 10 years, 10,000 years. Current rates of extinction could be, in the long run, be more important than many of the other factors for human welfare. All are interlinked and all represent pressure on the Earth's environment. Well, there's now a seventh factor. I mentioned six, and the seventh, of course, <coughs> is technology. They arise from the risks and opportunities which technology represents. Damage to the ozone layer, you may remember, which, damage, which protects ecosystems from harmful ultraviolet radiation from the sun, was the first to receive major public attention. And here we only just missed disaster, a point not always understood. The eventual result was to establish international agreements to ban the, ban the manufacture and use of fluorocarbons. But this may be only the beginning. In a recent book by the President of the Royal Society, Sir Martin, now Lord Rees, explored the dangers arising from human inventiveness, human folly, human wickedness, and human inadvertence. The ramifications of information technology, nanotechnology, and nuclear experimentation and the rest have still to be understood, but Lord Rees's conclusion was 